Um, when you when you look at the people that well, the incredible artists that that Nikki worked with, um, it kind of really shows just the immense talent that he had. Um, how how did this movie come about? Okay, um, I've got to blame Graham Parker wherever he is. He's here somewhere. Uh, my partner and co-producer John Wood. Uh, raised some money for a memorial bench in the shape of a grand piano. And uh, a, a, it raised a lot of money. Um, and in fact, the, the leftover money has gone towards a bursary of the Royal College of Music in Nicky's name. And at the, op uh, at the opening of the, uh, of the memorial bench, Graham Parker happened to mention to John, this would make a really great film. So that was the start of it. The second part of it was that... Um, a, f a friend of John, Valentine Palmer, and, and two of his children are here tonight, um, got me involved. And then I got Chris Kimsey involved, and it moved on from there. And so how long ago was this? Four years ago. Four, four years. Four years ago, November 2019, we uh, shot some interviews. We shot um, Chris, Bill Wyman, Glyn Johns, um, Julian Dawson came across. Harry Shearer turned up, he happened to be in London and said he'd, he'd heard on social media that we were, we were uh, doing these interviews and could he come along. Um, and then a great friend of mine, Emma Oxley, who's in the audience, is a great editor, cut together a promo. And then COVID hit, <laughs> right. which as everybody knows, put everybody back. And then so when we raised enough money to start production and we, we shot all of these wonderful interviews, Emma couldn't edit it, and she said the next best thing is Ashley Scott, who edited it. And um, he did a wonderful job, I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah, fantastic job. Um, yeah, I can't imagine that you had any problems getting people to be involved in the, in, in the, in the documentary. No, the, the, the hardest bit was, was the aftermath of COVID, yeah. because the age of a lot of these rock and rollers was of of a vulnerable age and so they were very cautious about you know what happens you know so can we in, can we shoot the interview outside can we do this can we do that and and we overcame all of those problems and we we had a, a partner in, in who was based in Florida and he would go off and shoot the American interviews and the ones that he couldn't get to um, we would link up on on zoom so they'd have the videographer there and I'd be on Zoom asking the questions and, you know, COVID even hit me, you know, I was due, yeah. to, due to interview Dave Davis and suddenly I was hit with COVID and so my daughter did the interview. Wow. Okay. And it's a, family, it's a family affair. It's my, a family affair. I know you yeah. were telling me that your son was involved um, as well. My, my son's a 2D uh, supervisor in VFX, and he did all of the, uh, the graphics, and he did the opening titles and the poster, yeah. which I'm very proud of him for. Great. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> well done. And um, uh, Chris, obviously you've worked with Nikki throughout the years on, on some you know, masterpieces. Can you remember the first time that you worked with him and what, what you thought, the impact that that had on you? Um, the, the first time I worked with Nicky was on the Stones album and um, I'd hear him playing um, just from down the hallway. I'd hear this playing and thought, my God, that guy is just amazing. And, and on first meeting him, couldn't believe that this frail figure was just playing such wonderful music and his whole body was involved in, you know, in, in the piano. It, it was quite extraordinary to see him, that um, the, the illness kind of disappeared when he sat down at the keys and started to play. Um, he, his musicality and, and what he gave to all those records, it's quite insane really that he played on so many records that are still played yeah. over and over today. They're part of our DNA, our musical history. Um, it, it astounds me. When Mike asked me to get involved in this project, um, I mean, I only knew Nicky for a, a very small part of what um, he was involved with. Obviously with the Stones, there's another man called Diesel Part West that I produced and I got Nicky to play on that because if, if you told a band you were working with, well, I can get Nicky Hopkins to come down and play them. Like, really? It was like they were just amazed. So um, to be involved with this project and to, to share what he was involved with, with everybody and, and to get 
all the artists on board yeah. was um, that that was as Mike said it, it was a challenge because after COVID there was quite a bit of resistance from people. Um, I had to prod Pete Townsend at least four times to get him <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to give us his voice over, but he did very gracefully. And and not that anyone didn't want to you know to give their memories of Nikki because that you can see and feel in the film that they all experienced such a wonderful time and and what they received from him was remarkable. Yeah, um, he he somehow it seemed like he just managed to fit in wherever he was, and I guess that's kind of the beauty of being a fan, a session musician. Like to to be a successful session musician, you have to just be able to fit in wherever you are. Yes, you do. You you can't, as as Billy Nichols said, you you don't want another ego coming into the situation. There's big enough egos within the band or the or the artists themselves to to consider. So, but Nicky, um, as my good friend Paddy Milner, um, who um, I hold in very high regard. When I first heard Paddy play, I thought I was hearing Nicky play again down the hall. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and to have Paddy demonstrate and study what Nicky played really blew my mind again when I heard you know, what was happening there. And to have that in the film is, is, is very special. Um, but Nicky, it, it's extraordinary. I was thinking tonight about that, you know, you've got electric guitars, you've got the piano. The piano was around, I mean, it's like sitting down with an orchestra at your hands and you can do so much with it. And Nicky, I can't imagine Nicky playing on an album and someone saying, I'm not going to use that. I think Nicky, you know, all his performances are out there, which is, that's wonderful, so. What, was he aware of, of his talent? Like, what, you know, because I know... Like no, I, I no, because there's no ego. There's no, he, he, he just knows what he can give to the project, give to the music, and and that's his joy. That is his life. That's what he exists for. Um, when you, it, it's um, when you get to that point where the music is coming from another place and it's just passing through you, and and you're you're helping the song, you're helping the creativity. Um, it's a very special place, and he was there for a long time. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was indeed. And I mean, I mean, with with regards to obviously him suffering with Crohn's disease and stuff, were there times when when you, you felt like, I mean, um, Julian, you 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 wrote his biography. Do you do you feel like maybe having Crohn's kind of helped push him because maybe he was aware that he didn't have as long as maybe everyone else? I don't think that probably was part of his life because his whole life was just an endless succession of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I don't think he was focused on, he certainly didn't uh, let on to people that he was ill and there were times when he was too ill to be able to do something but I didn't hear from a single person ever that he couldn't turn up in the studio, let them down or ever play badly. He always played absolutely the top of his game what, what were some of his influences did, did well he 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 um he as, as we heard he went to to the royal, yeah. royal academy for to learn to be a classical pianist and uh, his sister d brought home some rock and roll records i think right. jerry lee lewis and little richard and that was the end of the classical period for him and then he joined the lord such band when he was 16 so he was incredibly young but he obviously gathered a lot of influences from around. Albert Ammons was one he mentioned, okay. Mead Lux Lewis. These were all Chicago players and uh, blues players from America. And he, he had this extraordinary mixture that I don't think anybody else has ever achieved. Would you agree with that, Paddy? Um, yeah, he had su such a broad palette of influences, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, right across the board, which obviously helped him in his his recording career, his session career. He was able to go from like playing the intro to the Kinks session man, you know, doing a sort of uh, baroque harpsichord part to to you know playing that that, that kind of boogie blues influenced, well, kind of Chicago blues influenced thing on the on Revolution, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one extreme to the other, and he was able to kind of go between those those things very easily, yeah. Wonderful. I think I might throw it out to you guys if you have any questions out there. Anyone?
Okay. Okay. Hello. Oh, Thank okay. you. Yeah, um, uh, it's one. It, it's one of a few favourites that I've got. It, the the question was about Jerry Garcia, and the gentleman said that he was very pleasantly surprised to see that Nicky had played with Jerry Garcia. Um, Jerry Garcia was part of which the film goes into the Bay Area bands, and and obviously Jerry Garcia was the Grateful Dead and many many other things. And John Goddard quite ap aptly says, you know. Jerry Garcia, he was experimenting with different formats and he and Nicky got along really, really well and, and the track we used is, is a favourite and it, it just, it showcases Nicky's talent. Um, there, there was a, a, a point, we, we did a version of the film where Jerry Garcia wasn't in it and I'll, I'll let you all into a little bit of a secret, we had to re-edit the Rolling Stones segment um, because we had difficulties with the publishers and um, and and in fact the the band were behind us but the publishers up to I think 73 um, are notoriously difficult I won't mention their names but a lot of people will know they're called Abco but I haven't mentioned their name <laughs> um, and and so I had to re-edit it and with with Paddy's help and demonstrated Nikki's versatility on those tracks um, it tightened up and it allowed me to put Jerry Garcia back into the film uh, and and I think it was a and also David soul you know I mean it just shows you w what we talked about was that he was a gold star session pianist and David soul wanted him on on the track I hope that answers your question um, gentlemen at the top there have you got have you got the mic now perfect I Go do. Ahead. thank you <laughs> Um, actually, I, I wanted to talk about the Stones because um, the film, especially Keith Richard, talking about he'd have half a song and he'd go to Nick, Nicky Hopkins and he would basically fill in the rest. Um, do you not think he was aggrieved that he's never given credit? But having said that, you mentioned Abco, which I know all about Abco, <laughs> having known the Beatles story as well. Um, but from, a, I guess, uh, Exile on Main Street onwards, they were free of Abco. Um, you would have thought maybe some of the songwriting credits, or share of it, may have been given to Nicky. I, th I think um, Chris is probably better able to answer that. Than uh, I, I'd agree. Um, but um, uh, Nicky, as like a lot of musicians that I know and love and work with, would if they were in that situation working with um, a, a huge band um, what they're giving to it um, they wouldn't think of asking for any return a, a manager's job should that's what they should be doing looking after them um, and I think that um, I mean I think Paddy will support this as well is that when you're hired to you know to do that that gig you're not thinking about that I mean I it took Ronnie Wood like 35 years to get a songwriting credit <laughs> with, with Mick and Keith um, so um, it's you know that's a long climb um, and I'm sure that um, it would have been the same working with the Beatles as well and and the Kinks too um, I mean you could argue that the harpsichord at the beginning of that track that's you know that's composed by Nicky Hopkins, but you know he doesn't get any publishing on it. Um, so, um, and that was a time that things like that happened as well. It, it wasn't, um, a, a, in a way, I think um, musicians didn't realise um, the value of what they were doing. They get their session fee, and as long as they were working, 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 you know that that was the the most valuable thing to them. So. Um, but I agree with you, yes, um, that should, I mean, there's a case of um, 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 Baker Street with the saxophone solo um, and, the, yeah, and the saxophonist who, who played that. I mean, that's as much as the song as the lyric is. It's, you know, the melody of that. And, you know, that took years for him to win that court case. Um, 
to get some money. So, yeah. I, I was lucky to, I waited four years for an interview with Keith Richards when I was doing the book and finally got one. And he was in, obviously loved Nikki and was very happy to, to be doing it finally. And I did, it, the, the conversation was so friendly that I actually trusted myself to say, there were a couple of moments there when Nikki's piano was so important. I'm surprised, you know, that he didn't get a credit. And he said, his answer to that was, oh, well, that's the Stones for you. <laughs> As if it was someone else. Yeah. Uh, and things like, we love you, you know, where the piano is the whole song almost. And, and he's, he said it himself, but that doesn't seem to be a contradiction for him. Oh my God, anyone else? There we go at the top there. I'm guessing it's still the same now, though, if you're hired as a session musician, well, isn't it? Thank pa you. Paddy would tell you more. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't changed much. No, so. not at all. Well, Although I think, um, I think kids these days are getting a bit, bit, a bit more, more savvy, savvy with it. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, more, it was, it was in it, in the business was in it in its infancy, yeah. wasn't it? Then I guess so. Everyone was learning. Yeah, well, and there is always that balance between yeah. looking at what you're getting paid for the session and how much you're contributing to it. And yeah. I think people now, I would say, if they think they've put something that is, is more than just a, a kind of f f filling out the harmony or doing something, if they're actually adding a melodic part or something, then. people are a bit more yeah, aware of it. Yeah. But, but the, uh, the, the tail end to that was the little nugget of uh, the interview that Nicky gave where he, he actually admitted that they had no idea that the songs would last 5, 10, 15, mm. 25 yeah, years. That. You know, so it, it's now that, the, you know, that these songs are, have become so popular again and I'm sure they will in another 10 years' time with another yeah. generation. And, and I guess in Nicky's case as well, you know, he was he was working constantly and back to back and I guess if you're a session musician you're in and out like that you just it's just another song and then mm. you know uh, anyway yeah. Mike well first of all Paddy I, I agree with what you said about she's a rainbow it just makes me realize it's just an iconic a part as Rick Wakeman on life on Mars it's it's of that quality but really I think I just want to say this was a fantastic start to the to the festival and congratulations to Michael, to John, for getting this up on screen, getting it done. It was great. It was really, really a great <laughs> film. Yeah. And the question is, you know, uh, presumably it will go on and have further screenings at other places, and what are the plans for it? Well, <laughs> four years to this point, hopefully not another four to get it out onto the big screen. We're, we're talking to um, a very small number of distributors at the moment, and um, th these things take time. So, you know, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> really? oh, some more questions there? There's the mic over there. There you go. I'm very interested in that clip about Chick Corea, and I'm just wondering about whether he had a high, obviously, a reputation within the jazz community, and particular people that you think of, like Bill Evans and Keith Jarrett and other very sensitive uh, jazz musicians, whether he actually mingled with someone from the, rather than just the blues and the R&B uh, community. Sorry, was that Nick or Chick Corea that you... you no, the clip about Chick Corea, obviously he's part of the jazz yeah. uh, genre, even though he's done crossovers. But I'm just curious about his relationship with that side, that genre, whether there he's had any um, close relationships, friendships, maybe. For example, Mike Garson, David Bowie's pianist, has obviously I don't, another I t career. T t I, I really don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I know he had a high regard for Nicky, and he was instrumental in getting Nicky into rehab. And, um, and, and I, I believe that, you know, th they kept in touch after that. But, but I really don't know very much more than that. We did, w we had hoped to try and interview Chick, um, but again, COVID got in the way, and then he passed away before the opportunity was able to arise. The reason, I, the reason I mentioned it because obviously his improvisation as well, he's renowned for that. I, I think his reputation 
reached out all over, all over the music business, but I, I think the nearest he ever came to playing jazz was with Charlie Watts' big band. I don't think he ever played any sessions that I can think of that would be classed as jazz, but, but he, was, he was winning Playboy uh, keyboard, called keyboard Player of the Year awards and things like that, so I'm sure that his reputation was pretty widespread. Yeah, there's, a, there's a couple of tracks on his first, first solo record, which, um, yeah, very much jazz-influenced. I wouldn't say it's kind of out-and-out out jazz, but, um, yeah, maybe, maybe a bit more on the sort of swinging Nat King Cole kind of, kind of approach rather than, I guess, like a sort of more modern Chick career kind of, kind of thing. But, but, yeah, I mean, it was clearly on his radar, and, you know, he, he'd certainly studied it to some, some extent, yeah. Uh, we've probably got time for one more question, or a couple. Let's, let's see how we do. Yes, we can hear you. To tell you what key it's in, the musicians are saying this is our. If you're lucky. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I play with Bob Dylan, um, but if you uh, if you are that session player, you're not. You don't want to be told what to play, really. You say, "Can you think of something?" That's what the band's there for. So, yeah, I mean, is, is the challenge there to come up with something? The band go, "That's great, mate. We'll keep that." Absolutely, yeah, and it's it's the the most joyful sessions are the the easiest ones. It was like uh, like Jim Keltner says in the film, you know, you you kind of wish for a great song because with a great song the rest will just come naturally, um, and I guess that also comes from having some musicality as well. And it, as much as as much as Nicky had all the this massive uh, range of influences, it's also about how you how you use those and when you use them and how you use them, which comes from much more of a, a musical uh, approach. And, and, and also, I mean, there's so many other things involved with a session. There's all the psychology of, of get, you know, trying to pick up on people's personalities, like maybe not consciously, but just, just feeling, oh, this, this person um, probably wants something a little more chilled or doesn't, doesn't want me to be more dominant in the session or whatever. And so that as much as I'd love to say it's just all about the music, there's, there are these other things that sort of creep in as well. But ultimately, I think the idea of putting the music first is, is, is a kind of session musician's goal, I guess, or should be, yeah. Chris, did you have something you wanted to say or no? No, I was no, just absorbing that and <laughs> agreeing with it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, sadly, I think that's all we've got time for. So um, congratulations on an amazing film. It's about time, you know, incredible, incredible artists. So thank you. Thank you all for coming along. Thank you. Well done, Mike.